Hello and welcome to episode 60 of Linux Downtime. I'm Joe. I'm Martin. I'm Hayden. I'm Gary. Good to talk to you all again. Welcome back, Martin. It's been uh, a couple of episodes that you've been off gallivanting on holidays and at conferences and things. Yes, yes. I've had some fun in the sun and some fun in Prague, but I'm back now. Yeah, looking nice and tanned, not like uh, <laughs> me and Gary. <laughs> Hayden's looking nice and tanned as well, but uh, let's not talk about the video. So today, instead of uh, a serious topic like we've had a few times, I thought we'd uh, just do something a bit lighter today and just talk about some of the stuff that we've been up to in our Linuxy lives, in our downtime, if you will. So uh, who's going to go first? Martin, you haven't been around for ages. What, what have you been up to lately? So I've been working on a few projects, one of which is brand new. And we only decided to start it last week whilst we were at the Ubuntu Summit. So there's a few of us from the Ubuntu community that have sort of decided this is a an interesting idea and it's called Butterfly. And we're going to have a go at creating a graphical environment um, for desktop Linux using Flutter and Dart. Wow. Right. Okay. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> The main motivation for doing it is we wanted to have fun learning something new and just trying out new ideas. So it's a hobby project to learn new technologies, learn new skills, make new mistakes and have fun doing it. And from my point of view, we've got Ubuntu Mate. I'm still using that. I'm still committed to it. I'm still going to be making it and improving it. But it's kind of, in air quotes, finished. There's not significant feature development. And I kind of know those technologies and I just wanted to do something new. So this has been at the back of my mind for a while. And it turns out that uh, Yannick Moray has also been thinking along similar lines. So we attended a bunch of Flutter, Mia and uh, Yuru talks at the Ubuntu Summit to see if this was a possibility. And whilst there are some significant technical challenges ahead, we think it will be fun to try. And now feels like the right time to start working on this. So I assume that's going to be Wayland based and you're not going to do anything X side? Yes. So it will require a Wayland compositor and we've got several options ahead of us there. There's obviously some existing ones we could use. Well, we could use Western or we could use something like Wayfire. But there's also an emerging project, uh, Flutter WL Roots, which uses WL Roots from the Sway project. And so that's got some sort of big names behind it, but it's very incomplete at the moment. And then there's Miriway from the Mir team, which is another Wayland compatible compositor that's shaping up rather nicely. So we'll have to figure that out in due course, which route we go down. But at the moment, we're thinking about like figuring out the technology stack. We, we know that we're going to use. So the Yuru team have been hard at work. They've made themes, icon sets and widgets to fill the sort of the gap that you need for creating desktop applications. Google and Canonical have been finalizing the specifications for multi-window supporting um, Flutter, which isn't there now, but is coming soon. So it feels like all of the bits are sort of falling into place. And then, you know, Canonical have got the new installer implemented in Flutter. The Yuru team have been working on the new software center. There's a settings app. You know, there's all sorts of interesting stuff out there and it's just new, interesting and different. So we've put the project infrastructure in place and we've actually started sort of building the initial images of the uh, what will be an operating system. Is the base going to be Ubuntu then? Yeah. So the sort of the graphical environment is called Butterfly and we are going to make Ubuntu Butterfly which is initially going to be a remix. And we think in maybe a couple of years, we should be able to sort of make a stab for sort of official flavor status. And we've got sponsors within the release team to help us get to that point. Right. So this is not just a technical demonstration. Then this, this is something that you think can actually work. And so therefore, my question is, how is this going to work with existing applications in, say, GTK, Qt, Electron, that sort of thing? So that's one of the interesting problem domains. There's a couple of ways to address that. There's another project out there, which is 
looking to achieve similar goals to ours. It's called um, Dahlia OS and it's very well established and you can actually download and install images. And theirs is a mix of Flutter and Fuchsia and Linux. And they've got some interesting approaches to that problem. And they're, they're trying to fix or rather find a, a good workable solution to running non-Flutter apps inside their windowing environment. They've joined our discussion forums and they've shared some fantastic information about the mistakes they've made so far and the potential paths forward. So this is all very much up in the air. Initially, just to get things bootstrapped, we will use one of the existing Wayland compositors just so we can get things up and running. We'll figure out how we tackle the whole compositor, you know, window manager problem another another day, another year probably. Our aspiration is we will deliver Flutter applications all the way through, but you will still be able to install and run traditional Linux applications on the same platform. Very interesting. So Gary, you've been playing with a carrier board for multiple Raspberry Pi modules. Yeah, so uh, a while ago, I ended up picking up a bunch of Compute Module 3 lights. Long story, don't ask. Um, <laughs> I know they're hard to come by. So I was trying to find a way to run all of them, and I discovered there's this carrier board out there called the Turing Pi. Now, they currently have a V2 on the market that's for the Compute Module 4s, but I was trying to find the V1 because I had the CM3s. Anyways, I finally managed to find it. And I got just about everything running on it. Turns out one of my compute modules is dead. So I installed a K3S on it. That's micro Kubernetes. I have a small container load of stuff I self-host in my house. Um, and the intent is to get everything moving over to that. So I took the existing K3S that's out there, um, that Ansible scripts for it, updated it a little bit, that kind of stuff. So I've been playing with that kind of stuff, just you know, trying to simplify my container setup. So while I understand that you can run uh, K3S on a Raspberry Pi just fine, aren't you a bit constrained by RAM? A little bit, yeah. The uh, CM3 lights only have a gig. Oh, right. I thought it was two gigs at least, but I have five of them that are working. So I've got five quad-core processors and about five gigs of RAM, but like most of the stuff I'm running is just sitting there idle most of the time, right? It's like I've got a Prometheus that's running, watching metrics, I've got Telegraph that's basically I've got set up to be smoke ping, stuff like that. So, like, it's not like I'm trying to run Elasticsearch, right? <laughs> so, like, I don't need gobs and gobs of memory. Right. That's nifty. And what size is the whole thing? So, the board, it's a, a mini ITX, and I just have it in a, a small, like, media player case right now. But it's just, it's got its own 12 volt DC barrel jack power supply. And then, you know, just it's in the case and it goes. So, oh, and uh, the board has a built-in switch too. So literally you just plop the compute modules in and there's SD card slots on the board for each Pi. Um, they recommend you use the CM3 pluses so that you have the EMMC, but I don't have those and they're impossible to find right now unless you're rich. <laughs> so yeah, I've just been going with the uh, SD cards for now and it works fine. So Hayden, you've been playing with the Windows Dev Kit 2023 for longer than uh, any of us have known about it. Uh, it seems you've got a pre-production unit. This is their ARM box, which is um, it's kind of a little bit like a Mac Mini, uh, an M1 Mac Mini. And uh, obviously you've been running Windows on it, but you have presumably been running WSL on it as well. Yeah, the uh, Windows Dev Kit was announced at Build in May. I've had a pre-production unit for a couple months now. I've been kind of pushing and testing WSL on ARM, kind of seeing where the limits are uh, on this box. The intent of the kit is to drive adoption of Windows on ARM. And uh, of course, for me, that includes WSL on ARM. So I've been doing a lot of work porting open source applications to Windows on ARM, seeing what that's like. Surprisingly, I use WSL to cross compile for Windows on ARM quite often. I worked with the Scoop team. Uh, Scoop is a package manager for Windows to bring ARM support to their package manager. And that's useful because it allows you to sideload certain community WSL distributions that aren't available on the Microsoft Store, like Arch WSL. And uh, just kind of seeing what this new category of 
higher end ARM PC hardware can do. You know, right now it's limited to Windows and WSL. There's been some efforts to get Linux booting on it on bare metal. OpenBSD boots on it, ironically, quite well. But in the meantime, pushing the open source angle on Windows on ARM. And I've been very impressed with the hardware. It is now my daily driver. And it's replaced a, a big gaming rig I used to use because even with you know the occasional x86 emulation, it's been quite performant. But I wouldn't let you use it to record today. Well, yeah. Or did you disobey me? <laughs> Hayden had an expression on his face that said to me, or am I? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have some questions. You, you, you referred to this as like um, sort of a higher end hardware. So what, what are the specifications of this device? 32 gigs of RAM. I want to say 512 gigs NVMe. It's got the Snapdragon 8CX, I think version three. So it's roughly equivalent to an upgraded Snapdragon 888. It's close to, if you track Microsoft Surface hardware, the new Surface 9, which comes in both x86 and ARM flavors. So it's basically that with a docking board packaged into something the size of an M1. Yeah, but the M1 Mac Mini smokes it. Even the original M1 smokes it in terms of benchmarks and performance, from what I've read, at least. My take on this is that it gets to about 70-80% the performance of an Apple M1. And when you factor in that it's about $700, I think the value is there. I've spent a lot of time, you know, and I'm still very interested in embedded ARM and lower resource ARM and getting those things to work. But it's nice to finally have PC hardware that is performant, that's not nearly as locked down as the M1 was. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to someone publishing the uh, device tree files to uh, boot Linux on bare metal on this thing. Yeah, interesting. So at the Ubuntu Summit last week, there was a presentation by Robbie Williamson, who was formerly Canonical and now at ARM. And it was a very interesting talk about what ARM do. But there were two key takeaways for me. One was his sort of call to the community to say, don't just assume when you build your software, you should build it for x86-64, you know, build it for ARM as well, which is something that I've believed in for a long, long time, because whilst this hardware is amazing, the software pool sort of diminishes significantly when you when you when you start running uh, Linux based ARM operating systems. The stuff in the archive is fine, but what like the um, third party software vendors publish, you know, through their websites and what have you, um, tends to not be available for ARM and Linux. And the other thing he uh, revealed is the Lenovo 13s, which I think you can get today, which is an ARM laptop very thin and svelte looking and uh, they're working on enabling linux on that and that should be for sale in three to six months with linux distributions pre-installed and i'm aching for something like that because when i was at um, kubecon europe earlier in the year and my colleague had uh, an m1 mac pro i think it was she didn't charge her laptop the whole week. And, you know, my ThinkPad needed juice every two hours. So, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm really wanting something, you know, wanting something with that kind of battery endurance. So I've got to ask the obligatory question. Does this mean we're going to see Windows 11 RT again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Apple is able to pursue the strategy where they say, we're moving to ARM. Just like before they said, we're moving from PowerPC to x86. And that's just where everyone has to go. Microsoft and the Linux community are ironically in this same situation where they have to support both x86 and ARM64 on an ongoing basis. So there's some interesting synergies happening here in terms of how 
developers like yourself are able to ship applications, FOSS applications for Linux, sometimes for Linux and Windows, now on both x86 and ARM64. Because from what I understand, you've been asked if you're going to be getting one of these to help develop uh, <laughs> Pigeon for Windows on ARM. We're definitely looking at it, but until we get our build story figured out, we're, we're not going to look at it yet, right? There's no sense on you know buying it now when I can't use it yet kind of thing. But yeah, we'll, we'll probably end up doing that. What's the Linux story like on WSL then for ARM? Is it comparable to x86? It's mostly comparable. Most major Linux distros ship both x86 and ARM64 images. We did at Canonical. Fedora Remix for WSL is available for ARM64. Unfortunately, the OpenSUSE distributions are not. Penguin is, of course. And Arch is available for ARM64. So it relies on the WSL distribution packagers, if they're distributing it through the store, to actually package both a x86 and arm64 image and then when you download from the store it downloads the respective image that you need so when we originally provided windows on arm support when it first debuted a couple years ago and penguin we actually uh actually had to test this on a uh, lumia 950 that i had flashed with the full desktop version of Windows 10. And that's a phone. It was a phone, yes. <laughs> so yeah, Penguin, uh, the the first builds of uh, Penguin for ARM on Windows were tested on Windows 10 flashed onto a Lumia phone. So <laughs> the Windows dev kit has been quite an upgrade in terms of the developer story <laughs> for WSL on ARM. I wonder what you'd be better off with, either WSL on one of these dev kits, or Asahi on an M1 Mac, or just cross-compiling on a beast of a Threadripper machine like you've got, Martin. Yeah, and I've been working on a project to make that even easier. So um, I've been working on a project called Machine Spawn, which is basically sort of formalizing a bunch of copy-paste I've had in my CI, CD, and build scripts for donkey's years. And the idea is very simple. It uses um, systemd uh, containers, and it enables you to create containers for Debian and Ubuntu currently, although Fedora is coming soon, for x86 or ARM. And so on my big beastly Threadripper, I can uh, run ARM jobs inside these containers. And I've been using that for a bunch of stuff. But the real kicker is this. Uh, with the help of Danny Llewellyn, we've got that running in GitHub Actions. So we're able to start a single GitHub action and then spawn multiple runs of this machine spawn inside it because they have VMs for their workers. And then we're running, I think, 13 containers inside it. And so our proof of concept was building 13 different versions of OBS Studio going back in time and for multiple versions of Ubuntu in one um, CI task. So I'm currently using that and this butterfly that I was talking about, the initial images that we're producing of the operating system in air quotes, which you should really think of like an SDK. It's a tinker toy for the developers, but it's able to produce a full ISO image of an operating system in about three minutes because it's all hyper-optimized with transparent apt cacher ng support and all sorts of stuff and boot bootstrap caching are you using system d and spawn for that containerization yes so ultimately what's inside there it's a wrapper around system d and spawn and then machine control can then operate those containers so the place i want to get to is that you can actually run up one of these containers and then boot it like a virtual machine so i kind of forgot you were working on this project and you may remember when you were talking about this on stream one day, I was like, we need to talk about this because I actually wrote something similar starting in 2016 that instead of using system D, it originally used Docker, but now uses Podman. Right. But it does the exact same thing. It's a runner for a CI project I'm building because CI does not fit Pigeon. Right. It's a pain, right? Like I said, we're targeting 13 different platforms. 
So I built something very similar using containers. So it's just funny that the different approaches where like I'm just like shelling out to Podman now and you're using uh, System D directly. Yeah. And what I've recently discovered is one of the things I was going to work on for Machines Born was the ability to um, build Debian packages inside these containers. But I found that there is prior art and it's called Deb Spawn, which uses all of the exact same technologies. It's made by uh, Matthias Klump, who's uh, one of the Debian developers. And it's perfect because we've he's literally read my, or rather I'm reading his mind because he created this a couple of years ago, but it does the same thing with transparent apt cacher ng support. And you basically give it a file link to a source package and it creates a container and builds and then you harvest the um, artifacts at the end. So, and again, it's using system D containers. So Debspawn, I'm just going to start using because it's amazing. And I'm going to continue to develop machine spawn because machine spawn is really about like building operating system images. I've been using it to build Raspberry Pi images for about six years or so. I've now got an implementation that's building an x86 image and I'm thinking I could harmonize that and I could have a single tool that could build your Ubuntu images for x86 and Raspberry Pi all in one convenient little wrapper. So I'm having a lot of fun with that one. I love system D containers. They're, they're epic. They're really light, you know, using Docker and Podman for this stuff. It's all possible, but Stepping inside with uh, System DN spawn, it's um, it's terrific. I love it. Well, we'd better wrap it up, but uh, do let us know what you think of this format. If you want to hear more of the stuff that we've all just been playing around with and stuff, you can email us, show at linuxdowntime.com. But we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Until then, I've been Joe. I've been Martin. I've been Hayden. I've been Gary. See you later. <laughs>